Hi, can you hear me? Hi, Irene. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Thank you.
through testing. That sounds much better. Very good. All right. So, um, good afternoon to everyone who is here in, uh, in Addis, and good morning, and good evening, and whatever time it is, wherever you are uh, in the world. It's a pleasure to have you here for our session on uh, creating a safer internet while protecting uh, human rights. Um, my name is Paul Williams, and I'll be chairing this session. We have an hour uh, to talk about this in our in our workshop. Um, if I sound a bit croaky, please bear with me and forgive me. I flew in this morning uh, from London, uh, but absolutely determined to be here because it's lovely to be physically uh, at these events. And I've decided that since the internet never sleeps, then uh, it's fine if I don't sleep either for a night. So I will, I will, uh, I will cope. But if Amelia next to me nudges me at any point, you'll know, you'll know what's happened. Um, so um, the most important thing today is that we're going to have six really expert uh, speakers talking to us. And then I am determined also to leave time for Q&A. So if you have questions, please store them up for after the speakers. I'll try and take some from the room, from the people here, and, uh, and some from online, uh, which Amelia will be kindly monitoring. And Alex will be taking notes uh, throughout uh, for, us, for us to have a record. So turning to our speakers, um, with me in the room here I have Felicia. Uh, Felicia Antonia, who is from Access Now and is a, uh, a campaigner for the hashtag keep it on uh, campaign. Uh, which is a global campaign against internet shutdowns. Online, we have Kazim, Kazim Rizvi, I hope, is there, uh, who is a public policy entrepreneur and founder of an emerging policy think tank called The Dialogue, and I think is in India uh, today online, so probably quite late evening, I imagine, there for Kazim. Irene Khan, uh, we have, uh, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression. Uh, Liz Thomas, who is with us as Director of Public Policy Digital Safety at Microsoft. This is, of course, like the rest of the IGF, a combination of civil society, industry, and uh, governments, very importantly. Um, Bertie Vidgen is CEO and co-founder of the tech startup Rewire. And Sarah Connolly uh, is online from London, who is a colleague of mine. Hello, Sarah. She's from the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and is going to be talking about the UK's uh, new online safety bill, uh, which was launched this week. So just a, a couple of minutes from me before we kick off, um, because of course, as we've been discussing uh, the whole week, uh, for those of you who've been here um, for the days so far, um, the internet and new technologies are transforming our lives, obviously, in many ways for the better. Um, they are opportunities to realize exactly what we're talking about today, human rights, freedom of expression. They're the new place for freedom of assembly. I'm realizing this more and more uh, in my work. I am the uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office's Director for Open Societies uh, in the UK. So you might call that the SDG 16 Directorate. Uh, since we're in a UN building uh, here. And I'm realizing that so much of this work is now online and transferring to, to online. And an open, interoperable, inclusive, and secure internet can support democracy, uh, does support democracy and democratic processes. But we also all know that there are risks and, and challenges. Uh, so earlier this week, I was in an event which was about abuse and harassment of women and girls, uh, which we know is increasingly moving online and is a growing phenomenon about which we have some data, but we still don't really have a proper baseline uh, about how to tackle that. Um, we all know that online discourse can be toxic, it can be discriminatory, and, and that of course leads to self-selection of people who are online and fear of people uh, for coming online. Um, we know that disinformation and misinformation are growing risks and phenomena and can undermine democratic processes, the ones that I was talking about. And we know, of course, that people require access to the internet at all in order to be able to exercise those human rights uh, that we're talking about. So there are both positives and negatives. Uh, and so it's absolutely right that we're here to talk about those today and we have lots to talk about. So enough from me. Uh, let me turn to our first speaker, 
Um, so Felicia, we only have six minutes in total and I really want people to be able to ask questions because I'm sure there'll be lots. Um, so I'm going to ask you if you would to limit your and every other speaker's comments to three or four minutes if that's possible. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here to discuss um, how we can make the internet safe as well as how we can advance um, digital rights um, across the globe. And so I lead an amazing campaign called Keep It On, which simply means keep the internet on. And it unites organizations, over 280 organizations around the world. And in 2016, we came together to say that, okay, there is a growing threat to um, online rights. Um, this is called internet shutdowns. And we decided to start, coordinate, and work together as civil society to be able to amplify our voices, to be able to raise awareness about this growing threat to democracy. And unfortunately, this has spread across the globe. Um, the numbers that we are documenting with regards to internet shutdowns is increasing. Um, for instance, last year we documented 182 incidents of shutdowns in 34 countries. And 34 countries is the highest number of countries we've documented um, shutdowns. In 2020, we documented 159 in 29 countries. And even that is problematic because we were going through a global pandemic and a lot of our lives were moved online or we were being asked to work from home and to take advantage of the benefits that the internet provides. Unfortunately, we documented or populations around the world were being cut off in 2020 and previously. And some of these shutdowns are still ongoing. Um, we are here at the Africa uh, Internet Governance Forum where we are deliberating on how to empower people to come online, to be able to access essential services online, and to also um, yeah, benefit from what the internet and technology provides. Yet we have over six million population in the Tigray region that have been cut off since November 2020. And when the internet is shut down, it's very concerning because there are a lot of human rights violations that happen and it makes it extremely difficult for journalists, for human rights defenders to be able to document what is happening. And once that is not documented, then the world might not see the gravity of what is happening. Um, it also makes it extremely difficult for people to communicate with their families. And we always say that internet shutdowns don't happen on a normal day. Um, they happen when you really, really need to be connected with people. There is a conflict happening. You want to reach out to your family. You want to see how they are doing. And we've gathered stories across um, the globe, including uh, we recently published stories um, highlighting the impact of the two year long shutdown on the people of Tigray. And these stories cut across um, people have not been able to communicate with their families for years, and so they don't even know where they are. Um, like, education has just crashed. The health system is also being impacted. And these are the impacts that we are seeing across the globe, unfortunately. And prolonged internet shutdowns amplify these impacts, and they are disproportionate and they violate the essential rights that we are all promoting as um, stakeholders um, across the globe. So I think that um, it's important for us to focus on the issue of internet shutdowns. There's been a lot that has been done and it's become a global priority. Um, governments are speaking against shutdowns. Stakeholders are looking at how we can work together to ensure that the internet is accessible, open and safe. And we've talked a lot about um, digital development, how can we invest in the digital um, s um, space. And so these acts that are counterproductive, we know that uh, com countries do lose money whenever the internet is shut down, aside 
all the human rights abuses and the human rights implications of um, internet disruption. So I think that it's important for us to continue to raise awareness about this, to talk about internet shutdowns. Um, in yeah, we n it's it's a problem that we all need to address, and so um, this conference has provided an opportunity for us to be here to highlight the challenges we are facing online and I think that this is more of a blanket form of censorship when the internet is shut down and for those of you who might not know what an internet shutdown is just to conclude it is when authorities deliberately disrupt internet access or electronic communication um, tools and then it makes it impossible for people to communicate with each other to share information with each other and this can be done like a blanket shutdown, so there's no internet access at all. And we've seen countries also shutting down SMS and other forms of communication um, during these shutdowns. So it's the intent is clear to silence a group of people or a population or to quell protests or to cover up human rights abuses. And this goes with impunity because we are not able to document these and hold whoever is behind it accountable. And so I think um, it's important for us to speak freely about internet shutdowns because the impact is devastating. And so um, it's a difficult conversation to have, but I think once we ignore it, then it means it's not happening. And that is even more dangerous than um, whatever difficulty we'll face in speaking about it. Thank you. Thank you, Felicia. So now I'm going to hope the technology works and, uh, and turn to Kazim. Kazim Rizvi, are you there? Hello. I, I hope I'm audible. You are audible. Very good. Please go ahead. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you so much for hosting me. And uh, it's great to be amongst this panel and uh, really good to sort of talk about uh, securing digital rights uh, on the internet. Uh, so I'll take, I won't take a lot of time, but I just sort of want to uh, go back a little bit uh, and focus a little bit more on, you know, in the last five to 10 years, we've been seeing the rise of social media. We've been seeing the rise of the internet. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with Web 2.0, a lot of the people are now using internet for various services, be it uh, for shopping or communicating online, connecting with people online. So as the rise as there is uh, increasing rise of the internet uh, over the last few years and post pandemic we've seen a lot more people coming online there is definitely a rise in in terms of safety issues um, which users have been grappling with uh, so governments across the world and including in india we've been looking at how do we make sure that we have an internet which secures and protects uh users and safety of users while making sure that their rights such as freedom of speech and expression right to privacy etc are protected uh, so it's often discussed that you know this is a binary that safety and privacy and safety and speech are binaries but they're actually not uh they complement each other and it's possible uh in 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 the growing world of a new tech economy where more and more internet users are coming up to protect users online while making sure that their speech is protected as well the right to speech is protected their privacy is protected etc um we've seen in europe that you know uh europe is looking at a new legislation the digital services act australia is looking at a new law in india we've seen uh, the it rules 2021 and now in this year as well we have saw it rules being amended and all these regulations, if you look at the globe, are trying to come to a conclusion in terms of how do we make sure that uh, platforms work better in terms of uh, takedown, in terms of content takedown, in terms of uh, redressing uh, the grievance of the users. But at the same time, uh, we also have to make sure that the rights of the users, such as speech, is protected. And often there has been a debate that in terms of uh, are the governments overdoing the whole safety issue when it comes to making sure that internet is safer uh, at the cost of speech? Uh, there are debates in terms of uh, how the uh, safe harbor, which is critical to an open internet, 
uh, and the the safe harbor is also evolving and the understanding of safe harbor is also evolving we understand that the platforms are trying to do as much as they can in terms of removing content but at the same time we need laws which protect safe harbor we need laws which protect speech and we also need laws which protect encryption right and now that is something which is critical uh, while at the same time i think we also have to find a balance with respect to how the law enforcement works in the internet uh, in terms of them getting access to the right amount of data, in terms of get them working collaboratively with intermediaries, with platforms. So I, I, I do feel that there's a lot more uh, synergies and uh, collaboration which is required between uh, the companies, the platforms, and the governments to make sure that the internet is safe, but at the same time, speech and privacy of the users is protected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kazim. So yes, we're going to go on to talk a bit about that in the UK context, actually, when Sarah talks um, at the end. Um, so for now, let's move straight on to Irene. Irene Khan, our UN Special Rapporteur. Irene, I hope you are also somewhere, I'm not quite sure geographically where you are, but somewhere online, over to you. Yes, I, indeed, I'm online and actually uh, right now in, in Bangladesh, so not far from Kazi. Um, let me start by saying that uh, so far we've talked about connectivity, we've talked about safety, we've talked about uh, free speech. All three of them are actually protected by the human rights uh, system, the international human rights law and uh, rights offline. It has been well recognized in the international community by the UN human rights bodies that rights offline uh, must be protected and applied online as well. So I, I don't think there is a gap in law, what there is actually is a gap in the practice of the law, of international human rights standards. And that's where problems starts. Internet shutdowns don't just happen. Uh, they happen just before elections. Uh, they happen in the midst of conflict. Uh, they happen when people are protesting on the streets. Uh, safety of women, that is something that has emerged in the context of online um, uh, platform, uh, social media platforms. And on the one hand, uh, uh, women, uh, marginalized communities, LGBTI groups, ethnic groups, those who are excluded from traditional society, they are the ones who need and use uh, online communications to organize, to express themselves, uh, to, imp uh, to um, uh, advocate uh, for their rights, and yet they are often the ones who are most at risk on those platforms. And I fully agree with Kazim <clears throat> that there can be no trade-off between connectivity and safety uh, or, and, and freedom of expression. In fact, human rights are not the problem here. They are, in fact, the solution. Without human rights, I don't believe we can have a safe internet. Uh, it is through respect for human rights that the internet will become safer. It will become more equal. Uh, the digital divide, we're all aware of it. I think that is one thing we learned um, during the uh, COVID uh, crisis uh, and the importance of connectivity. I think we're making some progress there, but a lot more has to be done uh, when it comes to those marginalized groups. Those who suffer discrimination in the offline world should not uh, appear to be suffering a similar discrimination in the online world itself. And that is where I think uh, attention needs to be focused. I mentioned women, online violence against women, but it's not just women, women politicians, women journalists, feminist activists, human rights defenders, those who are speaking up, uh, those who are looking to bring about change are the ones who are most uh, being attacked online. And that, of course, is, is doubly dangerous because it leads us to, uh, towards a less diverse uh, society, and that can be in no one's interest. So I think there are some huge challenges here. I, I believe, and I, I, I sincerely believe that some efforts are being made by companies, large platforms, but not necessarily the smaller ones, and not enough by the large ones. On the side of governments, I think that uh, the trend is actually uh, towards restrictions. Now, under international law, freedom of expression is not uh, an absolute right. International law recognizes uh, restrictions can be placed on freedom of expression, but sets out uh, the boundaries of those restrictions. They have to be lawful. That means they have to be very clear uh, and not give discretionary power into the hands of uh, the executive of the government. Uh, they need to be necessary and proportionate 
and for certain legitimate objectives and need to be interpreted narrowly. So yes, uh, we, we need some regulation of the platforms and I have called for uh, smart regulation. We need to make platforms more transparent, more accountable, uh, and uh, it make platforms undertake human rights due diligence and observe human rights standards in their own content moderation. But at the same time, governments must not use censorship as a tool for managing safety online. In fact, it is counterproductive when that is done uh, and, and uh, serves neither connectivity nor safety uh, nor human rights. We need all three in order to make a safer, uh, more connected uh, uh, world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ani. Very, very interesting. And, and you mentioned a couple of times there the tech industry and platforms and regulation or otherwise. Uh, which is a which is a fantastic segue to our next speaker. So let's hear from industry then. Uh, and Liz, uh, if you're there, Liz Thomas from Microsoft, uh, over to you. Thanks. Thank you, and um, I'll echo the thanks of others. It's it's great to have the opportunity to to be here and to speak with you all and to to hear these perspectives and be a part of this conversation. Um, so I really just wanted to start um, actually by, by situating my remarks kind of in the context of Microsoft's overall commitment to human rights. And, you know, we really see respect for human rights as core to our company's missions to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. We really believe that people will only use technology that they trust and they'll only trust technology that it respects their rights. And we do want to see technology used for the good of humanity to advance well-being and to leave no one behind. And that really goes to some of the connectivity issues that we've already spoken about today as well. So our overall human rights approach, you know, really therefore incorporates international laws, principles and norms, and it includes our commitment to respecting the UN guiding principles on, on business and human rights. And, you know, as a company, we aim to meet that commitment in a, a number of different ways. But it's certainly one where we look to operationalize human rights through our business and technologies. Um, and, you know, speaking um, from where I sit within the company, one area in which we do operationalize that is through our company's approach to digital safety. And so when we're thinking about digital safety from a Microsoft perspective, and from the perspective of a company with a really diverse range of products and services, our approach is really about striving to create safe online spaces, while we're also upholding other important values. And in creating safe online spaces, we are also enabling people to enjoy and to freely exercise their rights. So including through that importance of association, the ability to express their views and access information. And when we're talking about preventing criminal conduct and content online, it's also really about respecting the dignity and other important rights of victims and survivors. And so there are four interconnected pillars in our approach to safety and human rights actually shows up in all of these in, in different ways. And I'll just touch on each of these briefly. So the first of these is, is platform architecture. And this is really how we think about design and building and operating our services with safety in mind, including thinking about business models. And so this includes our overall corporate commitment to human rights, which I've already referenced, but also our commitment to really thinking about how we build safety by design into our products and services and really understanding where risks may arise to our users. Um, the second place, and I, I think it's a reasonably obvious one, um, where this shows up is the pillar of content moderation. Um, and that's really in the way that we, we set and enforce our code of conduct and other important standards for use of Microsoft services. And human rights are obviously a really key consideration in the development of our content policies, but they're a yardstick for us in really thinking about the safety interventions that we use on our services and, and how we deploy those. We have a range of important considerations to weigh up and balance to really ensure that these measures are necessary and proportionate. The third pillar is around community. And so that's really how we help build spaces and empower users to build their own norms for behavior, which are actually appropriate to the nature and purpose of the platform. So we can, we can set the rules and help set the community standards, but we do also think it's important to help enable others to build safe, inclusive communities that help everybody enjoy their rights and have some of the important dialogue that Irene has already re mentioned. And we know that toxicity in online environments will mean that some voices go quiet so there's a question of how we work together to build positive counterpoints. And the final piece, the final pillar for us in the safety space is really about collaboration. Um, and that's really at the heart of this kind of conversation at the Internet Governance Forum and, multi, and other multi-stakeholder forums. We know that online harms are a complex whole of society problem, and it's one that requires holistic approaches. 
And, and we know that we have to approach these challenges in a multi-stakeholder way and to make the most of different perspectives and different expertise. And we really benefit from hearing different perspectives and understanding the potential rights impacts of both different harms and different choices that we make around digital safety. And so it's really important that we're open to hearing that feedback and getting those insights. And I think, you know, one of the observations I would make is, is as Irene has said, is we are at the point of general acceptance around the application of human rights applying online, um, but we are still in a collectively on a, on a learning journey about how we really best realize those commitments in an online environment. And really, you know, I think even touched on so far in the conversation, advancing digital safety really is a complex endeavor and it can require some difficult trade-offs and balancing. And this is really an active part of the, the conversation in the current regulatory environment. And I, I know Sarah's, Sarah's up next. Um, and I think, you know, we, we come together with a collective interest in ensuring that we have regulatory measures that are that are risk proportionate, that are practical, and really help support the rights of each country's citizens, as well as protecting the most vulnerable. And you know, translating human rights into safety regulation, it's it's not an easy task, um, and especially when you're trying to avoid unintended consequences and really understand what different proposals mean for human rights. Um, but it really goes to the importance of, of multi-stakeholder approaches to regulation as well and to the value of conversations like these. So I will, I will stop there, but um, it's a pleasure to be able to join the conversation. Liz, thank you very much. Um, I am burning with a thousand questions, as I hope uh, others, but I'm gonna hold myself back because uh, I said I was gonna open it up to the, to the, um, to the room. I think, you know, hearing you speak like that, Liz, everybody, I find in all of these conversations, everybody always wants to know what is really happening inside the tech companies on this stuff. How are they actually dealing with it? So it's interesting to hear you talk about the, the four pillars. So let's move on. And I want to thank uh, our speakers, by the way, for sticking everyone so far to the three to five minutes. So we are roughly on time. Uh, so let's now, let's now go to Bertie, Bertie Victor. Thanks. Hello, thank you very much. Um, can I just check that you can hear me okay? Yeah, I'm seeing some nodding. Yeah, awesome. Okay, also apologies are we camera off. Um, I'm just somewhere without fantastic Wi-Fi. Um, but my name is Bertie, I'm from Rewire and we build socially responsible AI for online safety. Um, now I often get asked, why should we use AI for online safety? And I think the really truthful answer is we shouldn't always use AI for online safety. We should look at every safety related problem that we're encountering and see whether AI can help to make processes more efficient and more effective. And only then should we use AI. AI is ultimately just a tool. We shouldn't go searching for problems we can fix with it. We should just see whether the problems that we have, it can be useful for. Um, but there are some key traits of AI, and I think this is true of all, uh, or at least nearly all automated digital technologies, which make it very effective. So the first one is speed. It's incredibly fast. You're talking milliseconds to, to process any item. Scale, any bit of AI can handle huge volumes of content, up to billions of bits of content every day. Consistency, this is a slightly controversial one. If you have the exact same inputs, you will get the exact same outputs. The challenge is that very minor adjustments in the content, so perhaps literally swapping around two letters in a tweet, could give you a very different result. And then finally, performance. In most settings, we can approximate human levels of performance or even outperform humans and get superhuman levels of performance. And of course, the really big one for me is that AI does not suffer harm. So we don't face the terrible problems that we've seen some moderators being subjected to from working with dangerous, toxic content all day long. So I certainly believe that in the right setting, AI has the potential to help. And I think there's two main use cases and benefits here. The first is to improve efficiency. Now, this is really just a question of policy enforcement. So let's say that you have a policy you formulated, perhaps it says uh, what types of hate speech you're going to be prescribing from a platform. How do you enforce it? How do you make sure that you're actually applying it as you need to? This is where AI can help. Now, it cannot tell you what those policies should be. That will always be a human problem that subject matter experts and policy experts must weigh in on but it can help you to enforce it more efficiently. And this is actually fundamental for free speech and human rights, because if you enforce your policies effectively, you can make sure that what you want left up is left up, what you want taken down is taken down. And that's not a trivial task. Um, I think one of the biggest issues that we've seen in the last few years is policies not being enforced in the right way. Um, I'll give you one example. We work with a lot of civil society organizations. Many of them have had their content removed or demonetized because it refers to the Holocaust or Nazis. 
this is as part of Holocaust remembrance. These are people trying to stop um, extreme rights, neo-Nazi movements, um, or trying to remember uh, people who have been affected by them. They are the ones who are suffering because the policies are not being enforced in the right way. So policy enforcement, very important. The second area that we see AI being really useful is for improving effectiveness. So you can embed AI across the entire service. And this might mean that perhaps content that you think could violate policies, you stop from going viral. This is, in effect, safety by design. You make sure that the way you're building your platform, the way the service is being used by your, your user base is safer than it could be otherwise. And for me, this is the really exciting possibility of AI. This is a step change, doing things that were not possible otherwise because we have this very scalable technology. Um, so in, in the spirit of trying to keep to time, uh, I'm actually going to wrap up here, but I would just like to make two very important caveats um, always when I'm talking about AI. So the first one is that to get any of these benefits of AI, we need the right AI. Now, I've, I've really not really had time to go into this, um, but it's absolutely not trivial to build good AI. It takes the right data, the right engineers, the right subject matter experts. It's always an iterative process. You're never done with the work. You know, there's, there's nothing more frustrating than someone saying, okay, so is the model finished? And it's like, well, it's done for now. Uh, next month, when you get some new challenges and some new problems, we're definitely going to have to rethink and update the AI as we go. Um, the second one is that using AI is a big decision and a big responsibility. There's a lot of serious ethical, social, representation-based, and privacy-related issues to work through, some of which we've already heard about today. Um, and if we don't engage with those really seriously, we risk very dangerous AI and AI that ultimately really puts people off um, and creates a lot of problems as well. So. Thank you very much, and looking forward to the panel. Thank you, Bertie. Um, very interesting again. Uh, really interesting, actually, to hear you talk at the end there about the sort of iterative process of AI. I think normal sort of person on the street often thinks of AI as this sort of mysterious, magical thing. Uh, to hear you talk about, you know, the processes that we all need to go through uh, to make it useful. Uh, in any particular circumstance and how that develops over time is, is well worth thinking about, I think, in this context. So, uh, final speaker, Sarah, you'll have noticed that we've used the, the privilege here of a US, a, a UK chaired session uh, here to be able to have a UK speaker last to wrap up. And, uh, and so, Sarah, um, we've had quite a lot of talk about regulation or not regulation, We've heard Liz talk about the industry view of them already taking human rights into account and, uh, and so on. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the, the UK perspective uh, on this and, uh, and how we're working on it? Thanks so much. Uh, hi, uh, it's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, and I should just start by saying how interesting uh, the, the various talks um, have been and how much I agree with so much of what has been said already. Um, uh, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, but Paul, as you say, um, uh, I'm uh, here to talk a little bit about um, the UK's approach uh, to uh, online safety. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't join you in person. I had hoped to be. I'm very jealous, uh, Paul, that you'll manage to, to get out to what I, I know will be a fantastic event. Um, but uh, the reason I can't join you in person is because, uh, appropriately, um, my team and I have been busy here in London working with ministers on our online safety bill, which uh, starts its progress uh, after a slight delay uh, through Parliament again on Monday. Um, so uh, there's been quite a lot of work uh, over, the, uh, over the last few weeks and this week um, as we gear up to do that. Um, over recent years, I think it's reasonable to say that there's been um, general recognition of the importance of developing online safety regulation, uh, and many of, um, of uh, you on the panel have, have made that point well, I think. Um, there is this need to balance what we know is harmful online um, and what we know uh, can be some quite difficult content with maintaining uh, freedom of expression uh, and freedom of uh, of privacy. Um, so things from, you know, the live streaming of things like the Christchurch terrorist attacks in 2019, the pervasiveness of child abuse material, um, tragic incidents uh, of child suicide following the availability of pro-suicide content, um, 
it's really clear, certainly from a UK uh, perspective, that government action has been long overdue. Um, and I do find it really encouraging that this realisation isn't just in the UK, um, uh, but I think as Kazim mentioned, um, we have the EU Digital Services Act, we have the Australia's Online Safety Act, um, to, to developing legislation around the world. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'm really keen that we do is keep having conversations between us about what that legislation looks like so that we are, um, we're really learning from each other as we go. Um, I'm conscious of the time, um, but I did want to just focus on a few principles of the UK legislation, which um, I hope will be, uh, uh, be interesting for the conversation. I mentioned a moment ago, the importance that we place on champion, championing uh, protections for human rights and fundamental freedoms at all stages. But in the UK, we're very clear that um, the answer to protecting people online, it's not censorship, it's not restrictions on people's ability to free, open, secure internet. The internet clearly needs to remain a vibrant place for a robust debate and free expression for all users. So that's why the bill has been designed to ensure that there are strong protections for freedom of expression in place. Companies will be obliged to enforce their terms of service consistently. They won't be able to arbitrarily remove content, which of course can be a barrier in and of itself to freedom of expression. But they, they will also have to set up appeals mechanisms when users wish to challenge decisions. So when something comes down, they'll be able to, um, uh, able to appeal that decision. Companies will also have special obligations to protect journalists' content and content of democratic importance. And to ensure that our legislation is enforced consistently and effectively, the measures in our bill will be enforced by Ofcom, an independent regulator. They'll be able to support companies to comply with the legislation and the independence of the regulator means that there will be consistency in that approach, even when governments change. I do think it's worth noting that we believe that our approach, which is centered around systems and processes and proportionality, rather than reactive blocking and takedown requests, will both get better results, but also protect users' rights much better. The legislation is well targeted, it's focused, um, and then the independent regulator provides guidance as to how, to companies, as to how they can comply with those safety duties. So although our regulator will be able to issue fines and block access to certain websites in the event of continued non-compliance, we're really clear that that shouldn't be taken lightly and any measures to do that would have to have judicial oversight. We think all of the package together, the whole legislative uh, uh, vehicle really underscores our commitment to creating an effective regime that properly tackles the problem of harm online whilst reiterating the government's commitment to transparency and to freedom of expression. It really feels like, and this conference is part of it, a really exciting time to be working on online safety. And I'm pleased to be here on the panel, even if it's only virtually, with a, an excellent lineup. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, all of the questions um, and answers that, that they, can, uh, they will give. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, that's a great way to wrap up the um, the panel uh, speakers. That that sort of balance there that you were talking about, right? That was that was very much how how my sort of instinct was to frame it at the beginning: the good and the not good. How do you make sure that you don't stop the good when you try to stop the not good? Right? Uh, you have to you have to maintain that balance. Um, all right. So we have how long do we have? Just under twenty minutes. Um, do we need to? Does someone need to go around with a microphone uh, to be able to speak uh, in the room? Um, but let me let me turn to the room first. I think um, uh, there's quite a few people here in front of me. Would anyone like to ask a question? Let me judge how many. So I've got two. I think right. Two. Uh, all right. So let's take two from the room then. And then, is there any online? So, folk online, uh, if you could possibly write down questions in the chat, uh, and then the people here to my right uh, will be able to see that and uh, pick their favourite ones. 
Um, so let's start in the room then. And I think I saw the lady right at the back first. Um, and we may need to give you, I know there's a microphone roaming to you. Super, over to you. Hello, my name is Mia Kulivin. I'm the chair of the Internet Architecture Board of the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. Um, thank you for this really interesting um, session and like the different perspectives. So we first talked a little bit about shutdowns and the importance of having open internet access. Then I heard a lot of um, multiple requests for regulation. And then we talked a lot about <laughs> content moderation and these kind of things. But I, and I have two related questions. One is, what is, what is the kind of regulation you have in mind? Is it only about content moderation or is there something else? Um, and then the second question is a little bit related to that. Um, because Sarah also talked about these problems that you see that are exposed or accelerated by the internet, these illegal actions you have there. And do you think that regulating the internet is the right tool to fight these crimes? Okay, thanks. So if I heard that properly, it was m moderation and regulation of the internet. Um, how do we do it? Is it right? Directed to Sarah, I think the second one. Okay, and then there was a gentleman in front of you would you still like to ask a question, sir? Um, yes, but I'll happily wait to let the panel answer the first question. I'll, um, I don't want to run out of time, so I'm going to take two, then get the panel to reply, and then I'm going to go online well if that's if okay. You prefer. Yeah, thank you. If you prefer. Um, I, I wanted to ask the panel about um, the responsibility to protect human rights. Um, businesses have a responsibility to respect human rights. Governments have two responsibilities. One, to respect human rights, that is not to be infringing on themselves, but also to protect human rights, which means to intervene in their own societies where the overall outcomes are ones in which f human rights are not being fully vindicated in the, way, in the way that they should be. Now, in the area of content sort of regulation and dealing with the harms that we've been seeing, Governments, many governments, have been placing a lot of responsibilities on private sector actors to intervene and regulate content, often leading to go um, to expectations that go far further than the government would itself be able to require if, if th they acted directly. Uh, it's always understood that companies can go much further, and each individual company may not even consider itself as infringing on human rights because our service, because our service, well, it's one service, but the overall aggregate impact of the pressure on those companies across the market from governments that those companies should be intervening to deal with harmful material could well add up to an, um, to an overall impact on the human rights within that particular environment that maybe does disclose a duty to intervene to protect against things having in aggregate gone too far the other way. So I'm asking whether the panel think that when countries that aspire to lead the world in how to regulate harmful content should be focusing on not, uh, not just on specific measures to deal with that harmful content and then generalities about how prote to protect freedom of expression. But maybe should, should they, does the duty to protect include a requirement that they should be just as attentive to the specificities that should be required in order to make sure that human rights are fully vindicated? Thank you, thank you very much. So, so risks of over-regulation and the specificities uh, that you mentioned at, at the end there. So let me turn to the panel. I, I sense that some of this was directed at Sarah. The first question was partly a name, Sarah. So Sarah, I'm going to ask you to come in second, if that's okay, just to give you a, a minute's warning. Uh, would anyone else like to come in on, on these things? Moderation, risk of, risk of over-intervention, uh, need to be specific are trying to regulate. Rita, you're nodding. Would you like to come in? Over to you. Um, thank you so much for your question. And indeed, I think when it comes to the harms that we see online, the responsibility lies on 
all of us, including governments and companies. And I think um, what has happened over time is that um, we do have like civil society organizations and individuals um, and even journalists that flag harmful content to um, companies to be able to moderate or ensure that these harmful com content do not um, spread on their platforms. And this, the challenges we see vary from company to company, but it's important for companies to lead because these harmful content are on their platforms. And once you leave them there, we've seen situations where it's caused danger, uh, like danger to people. It's a life and death matter in like Myanmar. Um, we, we saw how the pro proliferation of um, cont um, hateful content and misinformation on um, platforms in Ethiopia um, over the past two years. And I think civil society has really been doing well in flagging this content, but then we need more from the companies to be responsible for moderati moderating the content and ensuring that content that is harmful, bearing in mind you have to understand the context, the nuances in these um, places, and also follow the guidance of civil society or people that are advancing human rights to be able to uh, moderate content. So I, I think it's a responsibility of all of us. Um, we shouldn't also take advantage of the fact that there is harmful content on, our, uh, on platforms and so our governments take the ultimate um, action of just shutting down those platforms. That also uh, violates fundamental human rights and I think most of us in this room are advocating for fundamental rights and so such outright measures do not work and it needs a collective effort for us to be able to address the harms online at the same time advancing the benefits that the internet and other technologies provide. Thank you. Right, yeah, thank you very much. And let me just check if any of the other panel want to come in on this. Can't see you necessarily, you might be seen on screen. No, okay then. Then, yep. uh, Irie, yeah, Irie, yes. please, thanks. Yes, I, I wanted to um, uh, intervene because I think it's very, very dangerous to focus too much on regulating content. Uh, I was arguing for regulation of, of uh, process uh, the due diligence of companies, the clarity of their policies, uh, their own trans uh, transparency, uh, remedies uh, for, for users and so on, uh, and not uh, intervene. State The state should ensure companies behave properly in that sense, but should not intervene too much with content that is lawful uh, but harmful. That's a very, very slippery slope. There are there There is content that is unlawful, and what is unlawful in the offline world in most countries, what is a crime in most countries around the world should be unlawful uh, online. But we need to be very careful that many governments actually declare certain activities unlawful that are fully legitimate under international law. And when we look at freedom of speech, in that area you find a lot of material that is considered basically censorship, by, censored by governments that remain uh, lawful. And we need to be very careful about touching companies touching uh, or, or governments telling companies how to touch lawful but awful uh, speech. Uh, that, that is where the risk is, you know, because what is, if you look at truth and false, fake news laws, uh, there's been a proliferation of fake news laws in, in recent years. And uh, the whole issue is what is true and what is false. Falsehood by itself is not prohibited under international law. Uh, and harmful content, we need also to look at the degree of harm and the response should be proportionate to the degree. Uh, so, even in, in the offline world, uh, not all harms uh, lead to criminal law, for example. There are various uh, range of options that are open. Similarly, for companies too, and many of the platforms have been doing it, some of the platforms have been doing it, there is a range of response uh, rather than a removal. So I, I would be very careful in, in this area of content moderation uh, to overregulate. Thanks. Thanks very much, Irene. So, yeah, proportionality, extent of regulation, um, moderation versus not over moderation. There's a lot. There's a lot there that I think Sarah, you and your team have been trying to grapple with, right? With the with the new bill. Uh, any thoughts on all of this? Um, 
I do. I have lots of thoughts. Um, I should also say I can see Kazim has his hand up, so I'll keep this really short um, to make sure that he's got a chance to. I, I completely agree with Irene. Absolutely. This is, this is not about content regulation. I think sometimes it can get very easily conflated so that people assume it's all about content. We are really careful in the UK to talk about systems and processes. It is not about individual bits of content. It's about making sure that the systems and processes are balanced in, in two respects. One for safety to protect uh, in particular children and to do exactly as Irene said, where something is illegal, make sure that that is not able to proliferate. Um, and uh, But to make sure also that those systems and processes protect freedom of expression. Um, and so it is a balance and it's a really, it has been a really difficult, candidly a really difficult um, uh, balance to try and navigate over the last I've been doing this for a long time and 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 we have struggled to work out exactly where that balance should be and how we should do it and and there are a lot of strong feelings about the the volume of things online that that are kind of harmful if you like um, but we have uh, and where we have landed up actually in the end is platform's own terms and conditions um, need to be taken into consideration. So in effect, um, there needs to be clarity and there needs to be choice. Um, and so people can choose what what to see, which platforms to use, but but often they don't know at the moment. So in effect, it's consumer protection measures is sort of the, 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 the way that we've managed to square some of that. But it is it is a it's a difficult balance. Um, but I really agree with sort of it not being around um, around content, but but it being around the systems and the processes. Um, I think um, sort of two other quick points. Um, uh, uh, someone asked in the audience about um, whether or not internet regulation was the best way of managing kind of harms offline. Uh, I think the answer is. Um, it's not the only tool, it's absolutely not the only tool in fighting crime, but there is something around the kind of speed and reach um, that things can can sort of proliferate online that that needs to be managed. Um, but it uh, it shouldn't be seen as the kind of panacea, the the silver bullet that will fix everything. There are clearly other other issues at play that need to be dealt with offline. Um, but it but the kind of as I said, the speed and the reach is what makes the difference, I think. And then the, the question about kind of private sector engagement um, and over intervention, um, I think, again, it is about being really clear, including to companies, about that balance between various freedoms and safety and making sure that they have, have are very conscious of that. And in fact, the piece of legislation that we're taking through is absolutely explicit about the need to balance um, freedom of expression and democratic content uh, alongside managing uh, managing uh, harms online, particularly uh, particularly around kind of illegal content and, and children. Um, but uh, this is a sector also which is which has largely not been regulated, and um, a bit like health and safety or banking, you know, th there are there are plenty of other very large sectors that have been regulated. Um, as they have got bigger and had more of an impact on people's lives. And, and I think in that sense, we think that's, you know, it is analogous to other sectors and it's about getting the right regulation as opposed to having no regulation. Thanks, thanks very much, Seth. So um, I think Kazim has his hand up as well. And then what I might do is I might ask Amelia uh, or Alex to maybe summarize the conversation that's going online, which I'm afraid I can't see, um, but we'll definitely catch up on afterwards. And then I think we'll have to close. So, um, Kazim, thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think even Bertie has hand up, so I'll, I'll I'll make it very fast. So, just a few points. I think number one, I agree. I think you know uh, we have to be careful of over regulation. I think what we need to do now, you know, in 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 this era of uh, hyper connected world, is empower all stakeholders. Right? We have to empower the users. We have to empower the platforms. And we have to empower other actors, including civil society, to make sure that you know uh, there is adequate recourse for the users. Uh, at the same time, their speech is protected. So I think we have to start looking at greater transparency by platforms in terms of content takedown, in terms of how they 
uh, you know, carry out their terms of service and how they sort of, uh, you know, deliver on safety. Greater transparency in terms of how governments are requesting for takedowns as well. At the same time, uh, I think, you know, in India, we've seen recently that in the recent amendments to the IT Act, the government has focused on improving transparency by platform. So I think we've seen some steps taking place here in India, but I think globally, we have to sort of look at uh, an increase in the level of transparency by both platforms and the government. Uh, just a couple of uh, points. One on AI, I think, you know, uh, we know that platforms are using AI uh, to sort of uh, remove content. And a lot of the times uh, they do sort of, they, they use the technology to, uh, it's, it's automated in terms of the way the content is removed and taken down because there's so much content online. But I think we have to start building in processes within how AI is developed. Uh, and which is why we have to start looking at diversity by design within the AI tools so that we have people from across geographies, across different cultures. And for a geography, let's say uh, like India, or let's say even anywhere in Asia or uh, or different, different ecosystems, we have to look at responding to cultural diversity, responding to, uh, you know, different types of communities. Uh, and so the people who code and develop AI, they have to represent and the geography uh, more proportionately. And I think that has to happen with respect to how, uh, you know, the future AI engineers are hired and the way they remove content. So we have to look at diversifying uh, uh, the developer community of AI. And I think sort of last point is around, you know, making sure that again, a greater collaboration, but making sure that uh, there is a sense of purpose in terms of content safety in terms of takedown, in terms of removal of CSAM content, but uh, it has to be done in a way that speech is protected and privacy is maintained. Thank you very much. Yeah, a very important point I think you made there on AI and diversity. Uh, so we have only two minutes left in the session, I'm afraid, and one of the advantages of having a brilliant panel is that they all want to speak. So I'm going to give Bertie and then Liz uh, the chance to speak for, I'm afraid, just one minute each, because otherwise we'll run over time and that'll be bad for the, for the next sessions, uh, if you would please. So Bertie first. Okay, hey, great. Uh, I just wanted to say something about proportionality, um, and I 100% agree with what we've heard. But I think if you look at things like the advertising sector, which is tracking user engagement in a very granular way, if you look at what happens with enforcing copyright law, which anyone who's uploaded a video to YouTube will know is very uh, proactive and very fast, we do have the technology there fundamentally to do what's needed for trust and safety. So I think properly incentivized, it's amazing what can be done and the tech that we can we can see being created. So completely agree we need to be proportional, need to be aware of the market effects, um, but we aren't starting from scratch. And so we, we really could see huge improvements in the use of technology for online safety. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll uh, take the privilege of, of holding the mic last to, to really just say there's, there has been so much for in this that you could take in different directions. But I think the point I'd, I'd close on maybe is um, coming back to the question around kind of the role of regulatory measures versus other other measures in the space. And I think it comes back to the to the multi-stakeholder piece and the reflection that, you know, on this panel and elsewhere, elsewhere in the IGF, we have, we have the private sector, we have governments, we have civil society, and actually across those sectors with a whole different, different bunch of different roles and responsibilities and expertise, we have a suite of options that are open to us to address these harms, both online and offline. And so really remembering the importance of holistic approaches and, you know, effective proportionate regulatory measures absolutely have a role to play in that. But I think um, also, you know, really taking to heart the, the offline piece here as well, and these harms don't exist in a vacuum. Thank you very much, Liz. Okay, so I think we're going to have to um, close it there. I knew the whole time that we were going to run out of time with this because it's a fascinating discussion and just as I think it was Bertie was saying that AI develops over time I'm sure this conversation is also going to um, develop over time so thank you to all our uh, fantastic panelists uh, for their different perspectives on this issue thank you also uh, to the organizers I've got to say thank you to Amelia and to Alex and to the DCMS team in front of me uh, to Sarah also for joining um, from the from the UK host side, if you like, as a panelist, but also as a host, given how much you're doing with the uh, online safety bill. Sarah is going, I think it was introduced this week, so we'll follow that with interest. Really interesting to hear you talk about that and how the UK is trying to find this balance that we've been 
that we've been talking about. So thank you very much to all of you. Uh, we will uh, close it there, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the uh, conference. Thank you.